Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers uh, to, to bring us all to Vienna, which is a long time ago that I've been here. It's been a nice uh, warm summer about 20, 25 years ago. Um, it's a bit rainy today. Um, I'm very happy that we're going to be talking about sepsis um, because I think that sepsis is a bit uh, um, underrepresented in, the, in our awareness in the ED uh, at times. Um, I've got a slight conflict of interest that I want to uh, share with you. Um, we will talk a little bit about, uh, where's the pointer gone? Um, we will talk about uh, a couple of things here, and I will mainly uh, try to uh, emphasize on uh, the definition uh, business, which we all know is a bit new uh, to all of us uh, at the moment. We will touch uh, epidemiology and diagnosis, which I think is very crucial in the ED to get the patients early with uh, severe infection. And if we have some time left, uh, I will briefly touch the management, uh, especially the, the important aspects in, in the ED. I've brought uh, with me a patient uh, of, of ours, basically. Uh, I'm sure this is uh, one of your patients as well as uh, one of mine. It's a 60-year-old man with, uh, without any uh, relevant history, uh, past medical history. He's um, feeling a little bit unwell. Uh, he's got difficulty in breathing. He's got painful breathing, no fever, no chills, and he's got a ptosis of his right eye. He's, uh, he went to his GP, who found him to be tachycardic, uh, and sent him straight to the ED, where he was found to be with a low blood pressure, high, uh, high pulse, uh, a saturation of 90 with uh, 10 liters of oxygen. He seemed a little bit drowsy at the time when he arrived in the ED, um, was a febrile uh, S by definition, um, and had crackers on uh, auscultation on his right lower lobe. Um, and we, are, we did a chest x-ray, and we are pretty sure that this patient, uh, when we did some, uh, some blood results, uh, which did take uh, a couple of minutes, uh, didn't take two or three hours, but it did, it did take a little while. Blood count was normal, CRP was grossly raised, uh, and the creatinine was abnormal, uh, about twice the, the upper limit of normal. And we are pretty sure that this patient has got severe infection, and I think we all agree on that. Um, the, the question is, is this patient septic or not? Well, according to the old definition, no, the patient is not septic. He does not fulfill um, two of those four SIRS criteria, uh, and therefore this patient is not septic by definition of the old definition. And we all agree that this patient is severely ill, and um, we would probably categorize this patient as at least a severe sepsis, if not septic shock, or at least sepsis, septic induced arterial hypertension. Um, so the, this is the problem with the definition. And this is why uh, the concept of SIRS, this, this continuous flow of SIRS, infection, sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, has been abandoned uh, with the beginning of this year. Um, and there are a couple of reasons. Because SIRS is not inappropriate, it's an appropriate response of our body, of our immune system, to any stimulus, may be infection or not. It is also very misleading that we were talking about sepsis, but we really mean severe sepsis. And us talking with our colleagues and juniors, we know that this is happening all the time. We know that the epidemiology of sepsis varies from city to city, from country to country, from continent to continent. This is not explainable by the fact that this is completely different disease in different uh, areas. It is a lack of uh, uniforming, uh, uniform uh, defi uh, definition. And the same with that, going along with that, is the mortality varies by a great deal from 20% to 60, over 60% from study to study. Although the, the pathology of sepsis is increasingly understood, there's still a greater matter of debate uh, what is going on with our patients. And this is why sepsis 3, this is uh, 3, we come to that in a minute, it's three papers, three consensus conf uh, conferences that have been held, plus um, the, the, the three main uh, um, topics that we want to touch in a moment. Sepsis is a life-threatening uh, uh, organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated, and this is the key point, it's a dysregulated immune response. SIRS is a normal immune response, while sepsis, or this, our septic patient, has got a dysregulated immune response. This is the, the key uh, difference between the old and the new definition. 
And does it matter? Well, if you, if you think, well, sepsis and uh, septic shock, um, or septic shock is just a sepsis plus organ dysfunction. Well, yes, um, but does it matter? Well, not really. Um, what is, what, what is, what's about the, the, the management? The management is exactly the same. There's no difference in the management if you've got a severe septic patient, according to the autophagy, or if you've got a, um, a septic shock patient. What about the cellular, and, or what about the, the lactate? What about the hi tissue hypoxia? Do we pick up tissue hypoxia with our severe septic model? No, we don't. Um, are there changes uh, or there differences in pathophysiology between sepsis and uh, severe sepsis and septic shock? Well, probably, possibly, yes, they may be. Um, is the outcome different? Yes, it is very different. So we need to find out about sepsis and septic shock. And this is, and how can we do that? How we, can we find this uh, organ dysfunction? We can do it by using the, uh, an acute change in surface score. So our septic patient, according to the new definition, as soon as this patient has got more than, uh, has got a, a, a considerable organ dysfunction, especially in the cardiovascular system, we know that this patient is in, in a big problem because we know that a, a lactate and the lactate is a lactate above two millimoles per liter, plus hypertension, i.e. a cardiovascular surface of two or more, means bad news for the patient. And for us, we need to speed up because we need to pick those patients early up in the ED. I want to bring the, the surface score just uh, as a reminder for all of those who are familiar with it and uh, um, don't want to go through this uh, table altogether. Only want to bring your attention, there's six organ, dis organ systems with uh, organ dysfunction, and there can be a, a score of zero up to four. So you can have a surface score of zero or 24, and everything in between. And this is what we are talking about. This is very complex, and it's probably too complex to be, to, to be done uh, in the, on a day-to-day -day basis, patient-to-patient uh, -patient basis in the ED. Um, this is easily done in the intensive care unit, and we're doing this in the intensive care unit every day, and this is good, and this helps, uh, this, this can help uh, to, to see the progress of the patient. But on the normal ward, or in the ED, and especially in the ED, but also on the, on the, on the, on the normal ward in the, in the hospital, it all boiled down to three major uh, uh, questions. What's the respiratory rate like? What's the level of consciousness like? And what's the solid blood pressure like? And if any two of those three are positive, i.e. the respiratory rate is above 22, the Glasgow Coma score is below 15, or systolic blood pressure is below uh, 100, you need to search for organ dysfunction, and you need to search for the cause of organ dysfunction. Coming back to our patient, our patient was clearly septic. We knew this patient had an infection, but Sometimes it's not that obvious, and you need to, to see, well, is this a septic organ this cardiovascular dysfunction, or is it a cardiac cardiovascular dysfunction? And we did a lactate on this patient, obviously. We did a PCT on this patient. And if you've got a very simple equation of shock plus a lactate plus a PCT, you know this patient is in, in trouble. This is a bad news for the patient, and the mortality is exceeding definitely 40 50%. We have done in, uh, in Germany just very recently uh, a survey of uh, the sepsis incidence, and we found, I don't want to uh, go through all of that, um, according to the old definitions, uh, this is the numbers that we, that we found, according to the sepsis uh, 3 definition, um, we find a mortality of 40% for the whole group of sepsis and severe sepsis, uh, according to the, to, the, to the new definition. So we're talking about a... Uh, patient population who are considerably ill, and they're they are probably the most severely, apart from a multiple trauma patients, that we actually see in our emergency department. The site of infection is always the same, and why did I bring you a patient with pneumonia? Because pneumonia is the number one cause of uh, community-acquired infection and of uh, infection presenting in the ED and uh, in the intensive care unit. There has been a long, long list of, uh, of um, 
unfulfilled hopes, I, uh, I would say. Um, and uh, in the intensive care community, we've been going through an awful lot of uh, trials and awful lot of, uh, of drugs that, has, uh, that have been tested. Some of them uh, are now withdrawn from the market. Some of them are not used anymore. There is no magic bullet. And as Roger Bowen, one of the uh, godfathers of uh, the former sepsis definition, um, pointed out uh, 20 years ago, um, we need to spend more time on, on, on looking for a good diagnosis rather than um, searching for the magic bullet. So the diagnosis, and this is important, and I, uh, I agree with what Eric said about point of care testing and about speeding up the process in the, in the ED, but please do not forget, we have to take a decent history from the patient. We have to have a decent history, and we have to have a good physical examination. This is what we need to do, and I think we should do it every day, and we should teach it our junior doctors. I um, feel that this is extremely relevant um, in our day-to-day -day life. And we do have some biomarkers, and they may shed at some time more light, a, a little bit more light into the darkness. And talking about infection, we have those uh, four. I brought you those uh, four which I think are the most relevant and probably the most relevant uh, ones used in your EDs as well, C-reactive protein, PCT, IL-6 at times. Who, who uses IL-6? Two, okay. CRP? Probably all of you. PCT in the ED? Yes, okay, good. And lactate? Who's doing lactate? Who's doing lactate on every patient who's critically ill? Almost, okay, good, good. Well, this is now, this is, a, this is one of those uh, typical curves, those rock curves that you know. Um, we know that, again here, um, for sepsis in the emergency department, the, the dotted line is CRP, the IL-6 is the, the broken line, and the full line is the, the PCT. You can see that the PCT has got the best uh, area under the curve for detecting sepsis in the ED. Um, so there's uh, some data showing that uh, sepsis may be detected uh, using PCT in the ED. Um, and we know that, especially in pneumonia, for example, the CURB score correlates um, um, with uh, increasing, uh, or the PCT um, correlates with, um, with the increasing CURB score, not so the CRP level, for example. We know that there's a significant relation between PCT and mortality not only in uh, pneumonia, but also in pneumonia and in ED. And we know that antibiotic treatment, but this is a different uh, story, may be guided um, with uh, PCT levels. We know that lactate is an important marker, and I'm a big fan and big believer of lactate, or I believe in lactate. I'm, I'm a PCT believer and a lactate believer, I have to admit. This is my main conflict of interest, uh, 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 by the way. Um, we know that tissue hypoxia and lactate do correlate, um, uh, but the, the, the correlation is not as, uh, as, uh, as we think or as, as hard as we think. And we know that lactate and pH may correlate, but may, they may well not. We do find the yacht patient where we have a high lactate and no um, acidosis. Uh, we've got a hyperlactaemia. Um, we know that lactate does have a prognostic uh, um, or is uh, yeah, relevance or does indicate prognosis in the, in the acute care setting. And we also know that lactate uh, indicates mortality in A&E. Um, and we, I, I, I'm a strong believer, and in fact, this is uh, also implemented in the, in the German uh, guidelines for fluid resuscitation, that lactate should, uh, or lactate should be assessed as uh, one of the um, uh, indicators for uh, volume status uh, um, uh, in, the, um, in the critically ill patient. And we know that lactate clearance um, and outcome do correlate. If you get rid of your lactate, i.e. you get your circulation right, you get your cardiac output right, you get your oxygen into the cells and tissues. If you do that, if you manage to do that, then your lactate goes down, and this is good news for the patient because good lactate clearance means a good uh, prognosis or at least an improved prognosis. Um, there's uh, a slightly uh, newer data here, which is not significant, significant but the, the signal is similar to, to the previous study. And I think this is very obvious that as soon as you get your lactate cleared, um, the, you're on the not safe side, but on the better side of things. Um, what are my options? What are my therapeutic options to bring the lactate down? Well, in the ED, we have to think of uh, antibiotics. 
We've heard of uh, a ruptured appendicitis, uh, which uh, we need to bring to theater. Um, and then we've got early hemodynamic stabilization. This is basically the two main things that we have to concentrate on and that we have to consider and then that we need to be very good at and quick. This slide you probably all know. I just want to bring it back to you. It's the, still the most relevant slide according to uh, antimicrobial therapy. Um, this is for intensive care unit patients. This is a review of uh, more than 2,700 patients by Anand Kumar in Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, and he, he reviewed all files and uh, found that if you start your antibiotics within half an hour, the, 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 the black bars, your survival rate is more than 80%. And I, I, I've given you the data that more than 40% die. If you wait for, let's say, 36 hours, your survival rate is close to zero. Um, so this is, this is the, the, the point is, the earlier you get the antibiotics in, the better it is for the patient. Um, the, the sad fact is that only less than 10% of the patients do actually get uh, the antibiotics within half an hour, which is a very um, ambitious uh, uh, aim, but we should aim for, for, for the best. And hemodynamics, talking about hemodynamics, well, the blood pressure is the question. How high should the blood pressure be? Well, the question is, well, it doesn't really matter if you go for an MIP of 85 or 75. Uh, your outcome is the same. So do the blood pressure according to lactate, urine output, uh, level of consciousness. This is what I go for. Um, and uh, this is what, what I guide myself uh, with. And we know all the Rivers trial in uh, 2001, Emmanuel Rivers, Henry Ford, uh, hospital who showed us that lots and lots of fluid improved uh, uh, outcome by a great deal. Unfortunately, uh, it also resulted in considerable flooding. Um, and we know now that there's newer, newer trials, uh, repeat trials, basically. Um, I've brought you one here, which is the ARISE, um, and uh, the uh, early goal-directed uh, therapy was exactly the same uh, outcome-wise as uh, standard protocol. Um, the PROCESS trial, again, very similar trial, only three arms, early goal directed, standard, and usual care. You see there's a difference in fluids given, 2.08, 3.3, 2.3. Um, we come to that in a minute. Outcome is exactly the same. We re recognize, though, that the mortality is about uh, 20, 25%, uh, whereas Rivers was uh, about 50%. I want to draw your attention to this fact that new organ failure or new or, uh, uh, organ dysfunction within the first seven days was the most in the group with the most uh, fluid, with most of the fluids. So the, the more fluids you give, it's not necessarily the better for the patient. And this is probably why uh, Emmanuel Rivers is not entirely right in his saying, well, pump in lots of fluids into the patient regardless. Um, I think this is not true. This is the amount of fluid that was given in all those uh, earlier trials here, and this is the uh, Emmanuel Rivers trial, and you see there's a considerable, considerable difference um, in those uh, regimes. And the point I'm trying to make, and the, 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 the important, in my opinion, very important point is that too much is too much. Too little is too little, but too much is certainly too much. That's very obvious. And if our patients end up like this in the ICU, we know that we've done something wrong. And we know that, and this is, a, this is important for the, for the ED, we know that we have got a couple of minutes in the ED to actually rescue the patient um, and uh, then stabilize the patient over the next uh, two or three hours and then bring the patient to the uh, intensive care unit because these very sick patients need to be brought to the intensive care unit uh, rather quickly. And uh, then it's our job in the intensive care unit um, to then sta further stabilize the patient and then get rid of all the fluids. So in summary, and I'm well in time, um, the new sepsis definition is based on organ dysfunction and the dysregulated, this is the importance, the dysregulated immune response. And the concept, the SERS concept, has been abandoned. This is very important. Sepsis is common, and I'm sure it's as common as chest pain in your, in your um, or at least Patients with infections are as, uh, as common as chest pain patients in UEDs, and it carries a mortality which is above 40%. 
The SWIFT diagnosis, and I hope I could uh, demonstrate this, the SWIFT diagnosis leading to SWIFT management is of uttermost importance, and the management includes fluids and antibiotics. This is basically the main thing that you have to remember, and if you do that, um, we are quite okay. Thank you very much for your attention.